Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me begin by uh, talking about the, the key puzzles and questions that I want to talk about. And it really begins is, is there an equilibrium distribution of wealth? And if so, what determines it? Now, how do we account for the increase in wealth output ratio and the fact that the return, a return to capital, which does not seem to be declining, average wage rates, which in many countries seem to be stagnating or declining, and a share of wages, which seems to be decreasing, at least in many countries. The context of, of these remarks is uh, Thomas Piketty's book, which deservedly got, has gotten a lot of attention uh, recently. Uh, it suggests an ever-increasing con ever concentration of wealth. What is quite uh, important about the book is that it also emphasizes that uh, the period that I was growing up, uh, the period uh, after World War II, uh, was the golden age of capitalism. When I was growing up, I didn't realize that this was the best that capitalism ever got. Because as I was growing up, I saw unemployment, discrimination, uh, labor strife, lots of things that weren't so golden. But then I was uh, told by Piketty's book, uh, that's the best capitalism ever gets. Uh, and that, in fact, uh, inequality in the post-1980 era has soared in a way that was bringing us back to uh, the inequality that had marked uh, the 19th century. Actually, as I'm going to try to explain in a few minutes, there, are, there is a fundamental difference, though, between uh, inequality in the post-1980 world and inequality in the world that uh, existed in, the, say, the 19th century until uh, World War I or World War II. And that is that during the 19th century, wages increased enormously. Standards of living of most citizens increased enormously. And what's been happening since 1980 is real stagnation. So we have a puzzle. We have a puzzle that is, why is the post-1980 world different from the uh, earlier world? We have a puzzle uh, that's related to these movements in wages and returns to capital. Standard theory suggests that an increase in the capital labor ratio should lead to a decrease in the return to capital and an increase in average wages. And that's true even in models with many types of capital. So if there's uh, uh, skill bias technical change, it will change the relative wages, but not the average wage. The fact that the average wage should be increasing. There are some important aggregation problems that are swept under the rug in almost all macroeconomics, which are really first order, uh, important issues that used to be discussed and really limit the applicability of standard macroeconomic models. But this is a uh, fairly general result. Technological change, or an increase in efficiency as a result of globalization, would be expected, in fact, to increase average wages even more. And studies of the elasticity of substitution suggest that the elasticity is less than unity. So an increase in the capital labor ratio or the effect of capital labor, uh, labor ratio would lead to a diminished share of capital. So let me just look at, uh, review very quickly uh, some of the, the uh, data uh, that uh, really that Piketty was talking about and some of the problems that I've just highlighted. And I'll do this very quickly. Okay, so the standard chart is that uh, uh, inequality at the top, and this is just one aspect of inequality because there's also a, a weakening in the middle and increase in, in poverty at the bottom, uh, is reached, has reached levels that haven't been seen uh, since before the Great Depression. Uh, the second is to show that trickle-down economics, as usually re uh, meant, uh, isn't working. Uh, you know, in some ways, trickle-down economics never worked. The idea that if you throw enough money at the top, everybody would benefit. I wish it were true, because if it were true, we'd throw so much money at the top, everybody would be doing well. But in fact, as this chart shows, for the United States, median income is at the level that it was a quarter century ago. Of course, 
different demographic groups are affected differently. Some, and this is an average uh, or a median, uh, an important demographic group that I feel very empathetic with is males. And uh, if we look at the uh, uh, median wages of a full-time male worker in the United States, it's uh, lower than it was 40 years ago. So when I say that uh, capitalism is failing, any economic system that doesn't deliver for very large groups in the population, doesn't deliver for a majority of citizens, is an economic system that is failing. And certainly capitalism in America, and it's true in many other countries, is in these terms uh, failing and failing very badly. It's not because productivity hasn't increased. In fact, productivity has increased uh, significantly. Uh, this chart shows that over the last 40 years, there's been a 100% increase in productivity. It's just that most citizens haven't participated. Here's a chart that shows the average wages in the United States over the last 40 years, this is a pay per hour, has actually gone down by about 7%. Uh, all the increase in productivity has gone uh, elsewhere. Now, one thing I'm not going to be able to talk about very much and a, a dimension of inequality that is very important, particularly those on the right talk about it all the time and say, we don't care about inequality of income, inequ we don't care about inequality of outcomes, what we care about is equality of opportunity. But that's also not very good. <laughs> uh, inequality of uh, opportunity uh, is, is, uh, uh, varies from country to country. In the United States, which thinks of itself as uh, the American dream, the land of opportunity, the fact is that a young American's uh, life prospects are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in other advanced countries. So the idea that America is a land of opportunity is really a myth. We ought to call it uh, not the American dream, but the Danish dream, or the Scandinavian dream. And what one sees is the, there's a clear relationship, and this is really an important uh, research topic to try to understand uh, why this is so, but it's been well documented not only across countries, but uh, 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 across counties in the United States, that what you see is that countries with uh, more inequality of outcomes have more inequality of opportunity. There are many other dimensions of inequality that I, I would uh, talk about, but I've been told I only have 21.41 minutes. So um, uh, let me move on very quickly. What I want to do is spend the time this morning is trying to explain some of these uh, anomalous facts, what is going on. The basic uh, problem in Piketty's work and the, the, the easy resolution of, of the quandaries that, from a theoretical perspective, uh, that his analysis uh, throws up, is that there is a fundamental confusion between uh, two variables, wealth and capital. He talks about wealth going up, uh, wealth output ra ratio going up, wealth labor ratio going up, but that doesn't mean that capital is going up. Now, if you use a very simple model, W and K are the same thing, but in general, they are not. Most of the increase in the value of wealth is an increase in the value of land. It's not that there's more land, but the price of land has gone up. Uh, the data on K, the value of capital, actually shows a decline in the capital labor ratios in many countries. In Piketty's own country, in France, uh, the capital, uh, according to data that I've been able to get from the OECD, uh, the capital labor ratio is actually, the capital stock has actually been going down. There are other important measurement problems, and I emphasize that because uh, too many people in macroeconomics particularly just take the data that come out of the uh, uh, national accounts without asking, what does the data mean? And this is particularly true when it comes to capital data. So for instance, the value of capital could go up, 
because of an increase in monopoly power. Uh, increase in monopoly power means that uh, uh, monopoly ranks will go up. The capitalized value of those monopoly ranks will show up in stock market values. There are reasons for us to expect to, to not be surprised that monopoly ranks might be go up, might be going up, because of increase in uh, network ex effects that have been identified in, in areas like computerization and, and uh, telecommunication. Uh, the second thing uh, is uh, there's could be a shifting of resources to the private sector from the government, uh, exemplified in the value of the government bailouts. In each of these cases, there's a negative, but the negative doesn't get reflected in our accounting framework the way it should. In the first case, when there's an increase in monopoly power, there's a decrease in the value of human capital. But when we talk about wealth, we don't increase, include the decrease in the value of human capital. In the case of the shifting of resources from uh, the government to the private sector, uh, we don't talk about the de decrease in the value of taxpayer wealth uh, in the data. Now, uh, the next question we need to ask is how do we think of, or how do we explain, the increase in the value of land? Uh, important to emphasize that an increase in the value of land doesn't mean that there's more productive land. Uh, an example of why the value of land might go up is that if some Russian oligarchs uh, who've been able to steal money from their country and become very wealthy, decide they want to buy more land in the Riviera, in the south of France. Uh, this is the one example where trickle-down economics works. It trickles down from the Russian oligarchs to the rich people in France. Uh, so the price of land in the Riviera goes up. Uh, the same views of the ocean, the same water is there. Uh, in fact, fewer people will be enjoying it. Uh, but in terms of the value of wealth, it's gone up. Well, the next slide, which I can't talk about uh, because uh, Peter has restricted my, my time, uh, is that we can try to explain the value of these kinds of positional goods. And we can show that, in fact, they, the, uh, 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 when there is an increase in, in wealth, uh, there can be an increase in these positional goods in such a way as actually to lead to a decrease in the value of K of capital stock. There's another explanation of what might be going on, and that's related to uh, dynamic instability that's been well explored in theories of heterogeneous capital goods. Uh, in the theories of heterogeneous capital goods, where there are multiple capital goods, uh, one can show that the equilibrium is a saddle point, and without futures markets extending infinitely far into the future, or infinite foresight, there is no reason to believe that the boundary value, the transversality conditions, will be satisfied. Now, you can translate these kinds of ideas directly, two kinds of capital, physical capital, the kind that's productive, and the value of land, and the dynamic instability shows up in the amount of land and the value of, I mean, the amount of capital, capital goods, and the value of land, there's a dynamic instability. The suggestion is that it may be that we are in one of these unstable paths with the value of land going up, uh, and uh, uh, the, eventually there will be a correction of this trajectory but uh, unfortunately, even when there's a correction, it can go to uh, creating another land bubble uh, of the kind uh, that we've seen repeatedly in uh, capitalist economies. I want to move now into the next issue is, is putting aside this uh, problem of, of, which helps explain the anomalous behavior of the increase in wealth at the same time that the rate of interest has not uh, gone down, this says they're not a surprise their interest rate hasn't gone down because the capital stock hasn't gone up. Uh, what's really happened is just the value of land has increased. But there's another aspect of Piketty's work that's really interesting is that he suggests that there is going to be ever-increasing inequality in the distribution of wealth. And this is a really important research agenda, which has not been studied intensively uh, for a very long time. 
And one can formulate very simple models, uh, for instance, with dynast dynastic families leaving bequests among their children, uh, write down simple differential equations describing the wealth distribution that results. Um, in the simplest kinds of models, where, for instance, savings is described by a simple solo model, uh, where savings is a constant fraction of income, uh, you get a, 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 some striking results, which is regardless of the initial distribution of income, there will eventually be equality of wealth, very different from the results that Piketty got. Uh, if uh, the savings rate, returns on capital, uh, rates of growth of, of, of families are all the same, but wages differ, then in steady state, the wealth distribution will correspond precisely to the wage distribution. It's easy to, or not, I shouldn't say easy, it's possible to extend this to stochastic models, for instance, where wages uh, are determined, uh, of each of, of, of families are determined by a, uh, a simple stochastic process with regression towards the mean. That is to say, if the parent is unusually ability, it's more likely that his children will be of some less ability. One can formulate um, models of this kind with a lower bound on wealth. Uh, that is to say, individuals can't borrow more than a certain amount. Uh, and assume that families optimize intergenerational uh, utility. And out of that, one can derive uh, simple theories of equilibrium wealth distributions, which, in which the uh, inequality of wealth is related to the nature of the stochastic process of wages and intertemporal discount factors. The, um, the, the, a third model that one can focus on is where there are uh, a savings function where uh, all the savings is done uh, by the capitalist, uh, by those who have capital. Not a bad approximation to what has been happening today and is really the model that is implicit in uh, Piketty's analysis. Uh, in that kind of case, for instance, uh, again, an implicit assumption, a lot of what he talks about, is the savings rate of the capitalist uh, is unity, then in the long run equilibrium, you get the rate of growth is equal to the rate of interest. Uh, the important point here is that the interest rate is an endogenous variable. So in his analysis, some of you who looked at it uh, noted that he made a big point that, that uh, you get increasing inequality as a result of the fact that the rate of interest exceeds the rate of growth. But that's not consistent with long-run equilibrium. In the long-run equilibrium, the two will be equal. And in that case, you get uh, the rather uh, striking result that in the long run, the relative wealth of all families would remain the same. Any initial inequality of wealth would be perpetuated. Uh, really, what I'm trying to highlight here is that there is uh, an important research agenda, something that's not really been uh, 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 researched as much as it should, on the determinants of the distribution of wealth uh, over time. Uh, and some of the work I've been engaged in, uh, it's been focusing on trying to identify what you might call the centrifugal and centripetal forces. What are the forces at play that lead to increasing uh, inequality of wealth, and what are the forces that lead to uh, reduced inequality of wealth? Uh, and we've been able to identify a lot of the factors. Uh, uh, questions that, that uh, analytic questions that arise are, 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 can we interpret the increase in inequality that we've observed, uh, very strong increases in inequality since 1980, are we moving from one equilibrium to another? Is it possible for inequality to increase without bound? Or are we temporarily off an equilibrium path? Uh, as I say, I don't... Oh, my screen... Oh. Uh, I don't have time to go through uh, to identify uh, all the forces that are at play, either the centrifugal or the centripetal forces. Uh, one of the the aspects that I will have a chance to talk about is that if the very rich 
can use their position to get higher returns, uh, more investment information, more extraction of rents, uh, and if the very rich have equal or higher savings rate, then wealth will become more concentrated, although there will be, uh, an, uh, again, typically an equilibrium distribution of wealth. So that comes to the question, uh, what are, 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 can we identify factors that are currently at play that are contributing to this increase in wealth income, the, incre uh, the increasing inequality in wealth and income? And uh, there are a couple of things that I, I, I want to try to identify that go beyond some of the standard model, models that have been talked about. Uh, the most important aspect of this is trying to go beyond the boundaries of economics and to realize that uh, economic inequality inevitably gets translated, economic inequality of the magnitude of the United States and some of the European countries, inevitably gets translated into political inequality. And political inequality gets translated into more economic inequality. The basic and really important idea here is that markets don't exist in a vacuum. That market economies operate according to certain rules, certain regulations that specify how they work. And those affect the efficiency of those markets, but they also affect how the fruits, the benefits of those markets are distributed. And the result of that is that there are a whole a large number of aspects of our, of our basic economic framework that over in recent years have worked to increase the inequality of wealth and income in our society. An obvious one is how we uh, provide uh, education to different groups in our populations. Uh, if we pr provide more education in rich districts and rich parts of the country, then we help perpetuate wealth inequality. If we have systems of public transportation that make it more difficult for poor people to get access to jobs, we will get more inequality. If we have systems of taxation that lower the taxes on capital, which has happened in the United States since 1980, we get more inequality. And if we have legal frameworks like bankruptcy laws, systems of corporate governance, inadequate enforcement of antitrust laws, we wind up getting more inequality. So in fact, if you look closely at what has been going on, it's not, not a surprise uh, what we've been seeing. Empirically, one of the striking things that's been going on is an increased role of inherited capital. Uh, the d question is what is the role of inherited capital versus life cycle savings, uh, savings that people do on their own. And the, the evidence of overwhelming significant increases of the relative importance of inherited capital. Well, I don't really have time to talk about this, except to note that, that it's uh, easy and important to try to construct models which answer the, that question and which try to identify how policy changes uh, of the kind that I described above uh, uh, lead to increases in this, uh, the importance of inherited capital, leading to a society which can better be described increasingly as a, a inherited plutocracy. The final part of my talk is I want to talk about the notion, credit, uh, notions of credit, wealth, and inequality, actually in some ways linking up macroeconomics to microeconomics. I noticed, that, I, I observed in the beginning that the reason that there the, the, the aspect of the increase in wealth that really has characterized capitalist economies is really about the value of land. And I've put forward two possible explanations of this increase in the value of land. One is the value of positional goods, uh, the second uh, being off equilibrium saddle, uh, uh, off equilibrium paths, the saddle point nature of uh, uh, markets with heterogeneous capital goods. There's a third explanation, which 
sees the growing wealth inequality as a result of misguided monetary policy. It should be very clear that monetary policy uh, in the years before 2008 did not lead to economic stability. Uh, it led uh, to the Great Recession. I think it was a pivotal uh, role in that. But what I want to suggest is that the nature of monetary policy, credit creation, actually is related to the increase in inequality. So the basic idea is a fairly simple one. It's credit, not money, that is central to macroeconomic behavior. Normally, they move together. In crises, monetary base may increase without an increase in credit. So we need, really, to a theory of credit creation. Uh, and as we focus on credit creation, what we need to emphasize is that what matters is not the interest rate, the T-bill rate, mm -hmm. as has been standard in DSGE models, but credit availability, the spread between the T-bill rates and the lending rates. Well, what is credit? Credit is what enables individuals to spend more than the, more than the resources they have available at that moment. Um, and what one has to realize that credit is different from ordinary commodities. Credit can be created out of thin air. Well, what, what gives rise to credit? Uh, why, can people, why can banks, for instance, create this kind of credit that allows people to spend more money than, they, than they've already earned? Well, a credit economy is based on trust. Trust that the money that is borrowed will be repaid. Trust that the money that is received will be honored by others. If a financial institution is trust, trusted, it can effectively create money or credit on its own, issuing IOUs that will be honored by others, and thereby can increase effective demand. Today, trust in a financial system is, is, is the belief that the government will come to the rescue. And we saw that so clearly in 2008, where uh, the US government and European governments uh, basically said to the banks, uh, here are a few trillion dollars uh, will back you up even though you've misallocated credit and mismanaged risk. What's actually happened, if we look underneath the surface, is that the government has de facto delegated responsibility for the creation and allocation of credit to private banks. These private banks are effectively making use of its trust, so we've privatized in a key national asset. Now, the central banks have only limited control of the quantity and especially the allocation. And much of the credit has gone to the purchase of existing assets, leading to asset price inflation, at the same time that the central banks were focusing on uh, CPI, on, on commodity price inflation. This control, the credit creation process, uh, credit creation activity, is a major source of inequality in our societies, wealth going to those not only, not only going to those in the financial sector and to those that allocate credit, but to those that own the pre-existing asset whose prices are increasing. And it's most evident in the creation of inequality in the economies in transition, who went from a high level of equality to one of the highest levels of inequality in a short span of less than a quarter century. Well, that brings me to the key policy uh, issues. Uh, central banks, on this particular issue, the regulators could have circumscribed the flow of credit to the purchase of existing assets, which is a form of macroprudential regulation, uh, but it was not part of the doctrine of central ma monetary policy of the DSGE models. Uh, government could have taken a more direct role uh, in the provision of credit, of, of uh, making use of this scarce resource, their own trust, um, the crisis has shown that private markets were not good either in allocating credit or managing risk. Uh, relatively little of the credit goes to productive investment, and that's why the capital stock, the K, has actually been going down. Uh, and it emphasizes the importance of significant macroeconomic externalities, uh, which were not taken into account by the private sector, a line of work that has now become very central to that at the IMF. So this leads me very quickly to uh, both the policy agenda and the research agenda, which is understanding the determinants of wealth inequality provides a framework for understanding policy reforms that will lead to lower level 
of inequality. And there's a whole set of factors that I haven't had a chance to talk about, both public policies, policies that affect the extent of rent seeking, wealth appropriation that goes on, and social factors like discrimination and the role of unions. Before concluding, there are just two comments I want to make. The first is, there's been a major change in perspectives on inequality in the last 10 years. Uh, the first is that the distribution of income does matter. In contrast with the prevalent macroeconomic models, particularly those that were prevalent before 2008, uh, which, most of which assumed that distribution of income was of no relevance. It's important to know what aspects of inequality of income and wealth are relevant, but it is very clear that they are. The second thing is that traditionally economists have talked about there being a trade-off between inequality and wealth. Yes, inequality is bad, but the view of many quarters is if we were to do anything about inequality, it would slow growth, have uh, introduced distortions in the economy, lead to less economic efficiency. We now realize that, at least given the extent of inequality in the United States and in other, many other advanced countries, and given the way inequality is created, the sources of inequality that I've talked about, actually, we could have lower inequality and greater efficiency, greater stability, greater economic growth. Um, in short, Inequality and efficiency, equality and efficiency should be viewed as complements. And this, of course, is the central theme of my book, The Price of Inequality, but it's also now become a mainstream view that's emphasized by research at the IMF. Uh, again, an important research agenda is to understand the channels through which the effects, the effects get uh, exercised. Well, the final remark I want to make is that we can't be sure that in the next 50 years, the trends of the last 30 will continue. We should hope not. But it's not just a question of economic forces. Economic forces are the same on both sides of the Atlantic, both sides of the Pacific. But the outcomes, including the structure of opportunity, are markedly different. And that says it's not just economic laws, it's political forces. And so what's at issue here is not just economic capitalism in the 21st century, as Piketty said, it's really about democracy in the 21st century. There are, in fact, as I've hinted in this talk, many instruments at our disposal to create a more equal society. And many of these instruments would at the same time create a more efficient and better performing economy. Understanding the drivers of this growing inequality and the consequence will, and I hope should be, a major area of research in the coming decades. Thank you.